Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and thank you very much for joining me today, which is going to certainly be one of my more memorable webinar presentations. I certainly hope that it is memorable for you uh, in terms of the actual presentation. It's more memorable for me, at the moment at least, because literally the moment that I was about to click the button to start the presentation, the building's master fire alarm went off uh, for just about 10 minutes now. <laughs> and we were going to be presenting, shifting gears, well, quite literally, getting into the car and going somewhere else to remotely present. But literally, as we walked out the door, the alarm stopped. So here we are. Thank you for your patience. Sorry for the delay. And what a fun adventure this webinar has already been. <laughs> so thanks for joining me. And in case you're not already familiar, I am Tim Gray. Here is a shot of me. This would actually be in the Pyrenees Mountains, a rare moment where I am caught in the wild using a tripod. Before we get started today, I do want to thank Tamron, of course, for sponsoring the Gray Learning Webinar Series, for making these presentations possible. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining me. And be sure to check out the Tamron YouTube channel at youtube.com slash tamronvids. There's a, well, it's getting, it's a little old now. It was a couple of years or so ago, but there is a video featuring me out in the Palouse that was a lot of fun to make. Along the way during today's presentation, if you have any questions, over on the right-hand side, you should see a little question mark icon, which you can click in order to expand the right panel and you'll see an option down at the bottom to submit questions or comments along the way. And I'll do my best to get to as many of those as possible. But now, hoping that there are no more fire alarms for today, let's dive into our topic, Composition Considerations in Photography. And this is actually a really enjoyable topic for me personally, because it's one of the things that I love about photography is that it marries these two elements of technology and creativity. And as many of you may know, I've been a technology nerd since a very early age. In fact, I was a computer nerd before I was really into photography. But I've always had a craving, sort of a desire to be creative in some form. And uh, to be honest, I cannot draw or paint, or any of those creative art forms. I've tried and failed miserably, but photography works out okay, as long as you can master both the technical as well as the composition. And today I'm going to talk not really about, you know, all the rules. Well, I'll talk a little bit about some of the rules, but it, this isn't really so much about the rules that I think many of us are familiar with, but more just how I go about the process of thinking about composition, the things that I consider when I'm trying to compose a scene. To begin with, sometimes composition is pretty easy. In fact, sometimes, you know, photography almost seems easy when you're given a great subject. This lion in South Africa, for example, it was an overcast day, and so the lighting was pretty straightforward. It really was not a major concern in terms of exposure. I could pretty well just trust the camera's meter, and we sat there and waited and waited and waited because when it comes to photography sometimes we have to be patient of course and we waited until that lion yawned and the cacophony of shutter actuations in rapid fire uh, was pretty incredible but framing up is pretty simple in this case just kind of fill the frame with the lion's head now in fairness there's actually more to a simple composition like this than you would necessarily think of it in fact for many of us it's probably gotten to the point where things like this are a bit subconscious, that you are framing things up without really thinking about how you're framing. And so, for example, I've got more space over on the right side than on the left side, at least in terms of the, the full body of the lion, as it were. There's empty space on the right. That's room for the lion to sort of look or to move the direction he would normally be headed if he wasn't you know, laying down and yawning. And so even the simple compositions sometimes, they're not quite as simple as they seem. You do have to, I suppose, think about what you're doing, frame up appropriately, even if you don't realize you're necessarily thinking about it. Some of this becomes sort of automatic, like muscle memory. And I'll talk about some of the additional considerations that would go into a shot like this a little bit later as well. 
One of the issues with rules in photography when it comes to composition is that they have a tendency to oversimplify, to make it seem maybe a little bit too easy, but also to potentially get you caught in a rut where you're always doing the same thing. So for example, the rule of thirds, if you follow that rule sort of literally, then you're conceptually always putting the horizon, for example, at the top or bottom third in the scene, or you're always positioning a person on the left or the right third of a scene. And that's certainly not a bad thing. And it's great as a general guide, but I think it's really important to consider what's the real motivation here. You know, it's not bull, bullseyeing, as we often say, not putting a key subject right in the center of the frame because that's a little bit boring. But really, to me, at the core of the rule of thirds is a notion of striking a balance. So I imagine if I measured the, the median line of this curved hill, the, uh, the horizon, as it were, I suspect it's pretty close to a one-third position, but I wasn't thinking one-third. I was thinking that as much as the sky was beautiful just before sunset on this evening in the Palouse in eastern Washington state, the sky was great, but there wasn't that much texture to it, and the foreground was very interesting. The undulations of the hills of the wheat fields here and the dust and the, the light being caught by that dust that, to me, was the real interesting element here, with the sun being sort of a secondary player, an element of interest. And so it's about showing you the full scene in some respects, but in this case, including more of the landscape in the foreground because it's just more interesting, or it's sort of my key subject, you might say. And then finding a balance. Now, this curvature of the hill worked out very nicely. And of course, sometimes it's accident. You just happen to be in a good spot. Sometimes you got to move back and forth to find a good position or rotate your camera left or right to find the right framing. So that, for example, notice how the sun sort of fits into this little nook created by the hill. So the hill rises on the left side and it goes down on the right side. And that provides a little extra space for the sun. And so... This type of balance is something that I pay attention to a lot in my composition, trying to sort of feel, does everything feel spaced out in the extent that it should be? What should be that spacing? I don't know. <laughs> it just sort of feels right. It feels like nothing is squeezed too closely to the edge. Everything has enough room. It feels like there's just a natural balance there. It's hard to describe, at least for me, but I think with a little bit of practice in composing photos, it starts to become a little bit more natural. But I also think, you know, this is something that I would say is sort of a almost standard framing of a scene like this. I think it's important to also consider finding ways to frame up a scene differently. So this I would call also a somewhat standard framing for the scene. Uh, more or less rule of thirds with the foreground emphasized and of course the sun and a sunburst in the background with some clouds in the sky. A nice scene. But in these types of scenarios, I think it makes sense to also consider some of the non-standard ways of framing. Or really, I kind of think of this as, how can I break the rules? How can I do something that many photographers even might think initially is wrong and yet somehow works? So here, for example, this particular scene, I think having the sun in the frame is kind of automatic. Of course, we're going to include the sun in the frame because it adds to the scene. It's an interesting element. The sun, after all, is what's providing this backlighting for the wheat. But we can also sort of crop out that sun, include a little bit of the rays here, thanks to that dust in the sky. And of course, the key subject, the real subject, is the wheat backlit in the foreground, and a little bit of the ambiance, and really more the mood created by the sunlight. And so here I've got sort of the sun in the frame without the sun being in the frame by virtue of those rays coming into the frame. But taking something that seems initially as a key element of the scene and then maybe putting it just outside of the frame. That sort of relates to breaking some of these rules in some way. And I think it's important to keep in mind that it is okay to break the rules. All of the rules, which I always like to put in quotes, by the way, the rules of composition in photography... In general, they're very good guidelines. They're very good starting points. 
and there's usually a reason why those rules were sort of established or why they're taught. So here, for example, this is breaking one of the elements of the rule of thirds in that when you have an object, a subject, so a person, an animal, or even something like an airplane or a boat, something that has a front and a back to it, and if it's moving or if it's looking in a particular direction, then you usually want to give it some space. So if this bird is flying from right to left, I should have more space over on the left, room for the bird to fly. Here it sort of almost looks like the bird is about to run into the edge of the frame, and that's generally considered a bad thing. But while photographing this bird, and in this case it was with a fixed focal length lens, so I didn't have the flexibility at the time to change my zoom setting, to change the framing by virtue of adjusting the zoom on the lens, so I had to make a decision. And one of the things that caught my eye with these snowy egrets flying against the sunrise was that when they would touch the water and the drips and the ringlets on the surface of the water were just absolutely beautiful. It's a minor element of the scene, but I really liked it. And so I wanted to keep those droplets in the frame, but of course keep the egret in the frame and some of the reflection of the egret in the frame. And so and this is not, is not the only way I captured this image. As the eager was flying, I framed it up a little bit differently, some with a little more room in the front, but I really like this version with the rule being broken a little bit, not necessarily enough space, so to speak, for that, in this case, bird to look or move within the frame, but I made that decision consciously in order to keep the little splash ripples just behind the egret. And of course, as much as we often say that we want to include space in front of our subject, there's also an element of creating tension or curiosity. In some ways, you know, it can feel more somber, for example, if we have a subject that's got its nose right at the edge of the frame, essentially, well, not right at, but very close to the edge, essentially looking out of the frame. Or it can create a sense of curiosity in the viewer. They want to know what's that person looking at, or they're trying to interpret what the person is seeing and how they're responding to it, what they're thinking about. But again, first and foremost is keeping in mind that it's absolutely okay to break the rules, as long as you're doing it for a reason, and more importantly, as long as you're producing a good result photographically. I also find, and there's a variety of ways this comes into play, but that so often less is more. And I'll show you a variety of different examples that really relate to the same overall concept. But the notion that we don't need to include the entirety of a subject, the entirety of a scene. And again, we'll see several examples here, but one of my early mistakes, I think, in photography, and I think a lot of photographers make the same sort of mistake, is that I was always including too much in the frame. Everything seemed so interesting that I wanted to include it all. And sometimes just the finer details of a subject. This is a large door on a side street in the Campo dei Fiori neighborhood of Rome, Italy. And this door caught my eye, but what was most interesting was the texture and the hardware, and of course the shadow going across. And so I zoomed in essentially, in this case, zooming in with my feet, but getting close to the door and zeroing in on just what I considered sort of the key elements of that door. Or here in Venice, Italy, of course, we've got canals and bridges and boats and colored buildings. And these reflections caught my eye and I initially set up to photograph the canal and the building and the bridge and the boats. And then I realized, you know, I was there, this specific spot, not Venice in general, but this specific location, the reason I stopped in the first place was these reflections. And so I zeroed in on just the reflections, even though there's no context. I'll talk about context a little later. But this is, in and of itself to me, a nice photograph, it's sort of a painterly photograph, and I don't need for it to be obvious where this is in order for it to be, to me at least, interesting in terms of colors and textures. And for me, it does give me memories of being in Venice, Italy, but I don't necessarily need the viewer to have that same experience. And even something you know as simple as a hot air balloon flying overhead, and I think probably many, and perhaps even most photographers, would have a tendency to include the entire balloon in the frame. And to me, it makes it a little more 
sort of like a, a graphic element as opposed to a traditional photograph to tighten up that shot a little bit more. I don't necessarily need to include the entirety of a single subject, for example. However, I mentioned that when I first got started in photography, I tended to include too much in the frame. Now, I have a tendency sometimes to not include enough, so sometimes I forget about the wide shots. I get so caught up photographing, you know, an individual hot air balloon overhead that I forget to get the shot with a group of balloons seeming to fly sort of in formation. Well, very loose formation anyway. But, you know, forgetting to get those establishing shots, the shots that sort of show you where you are, that give you a sense of the overall place as opposed to the details of the place. I generally tend to favor the detail shots personally. They tend to be my favorite shots from a given trip, but I still want to show people what it was like to be in a particular place. And sometimes it's literally just wide for the sake of wide. I didn't need to shoot wide angle here. I could have zoomed in on just the rider on the horse and the grasses atop the hill here, and it would have been a very different shot. Not necessarily better or worse, but different. But here I wanted to show the expansiveness, relatively speaking, of this place. And of course, a big part of that was the golden light on the grassy hills here, but wanting the horse and rider to feel diminutive, to feel very small elements within the space. And so even though, you know, I very often will use a long telephoto lens and try to zero in on a distant subject, but sometimes even with a distant subject, a wide shot can work very nicely. And I think one of the key things is to think about what is the photo really about? I know a lot of photographers and other creatives will say, you know, what's <clears throat> the story that you're trying to tell? And I always have to chuckle at that a little bit because I don't usually feel like I'm telling a story. I'm sure we could add, you know, the, the story after the fact, I suppose. But I'm not usually thinking about a story per se. I'm just thinking of a scene that seems interesting to me. But what's really happening is that there's something that caught my eye that I found interesting for whatever reason. And that sort of is the story. So it's not the way I think about it, but certainly it's a way you could describe. And so here, a woman who is making a Panama hat, and I found it very interesting. So the woman is interesting, the scene was interesting, but really it's about her weaving this hat. And so I zeroed in and got a shot of just her doing exactly that, where the textures and the colors are very interesting to me. And so, in some cases, zeroing in on that which is sort of the core of what your shot, what your photo is really about. Sort of thinking about, why am I taking this photo? Why did this scene catch my eye? Why did I find this so interesting? And so one of the methods that I very often use when I'm composing a scene is to start with only the key subject. Now, this used to be something I did in reverse. I'd start wide. And then I would start to think about what I can subtract, which I'll talk about here shortly. But very often, nowadays, I will start with my key subject, tighten in on just that key subject, and then start to consider, do I need to add anything else? Do I need some context? With this particular shot, it was literally this shuttered window that caught my eye, in part because of the well, relatively strong overall contrast, but of course the color contrast in particular. And this was you know, a relatively busy scene, which is not conveyed in this photo. But as I framed up just the window, I realized that's all that I needed for this photo. It was really just about this simple composition, the, the key subject, the window and the wall, essentially. And so that's where I like to start more often than not these days, is with the key subject, is with the single object, in many cases, that caught my eye, that made me want to pull that camera up to my eye and take a picture. And of course, sometimes that's all you need. With these other two examples, I would say I, didn't, I never felt like I needed to add anything more. I didn't get home and say, wow, I wish I had zoomed out a little bit and had more flowers in the background. I was happy with this composition just as it was. But sometimes contemplating what needs to be added 
then you realize that you want to have maybe a little bit more in the term, in way of con context for the subject. So this is obviously a Moai statue on Easter Island. And this was something I felt uh, sort of as much as there can be a sense of, tr of stress in trying to compose my photos here. Because Easter Island is far away from everything. It's not the easiest place to get to. And I figured there was a very good chance this was going to be my only visit to Easter Island. And this happened to be when I was teaching on board a cruise ship. We were there overnight. That only gave me two days, hopefully with good weather, to get interesting photos. And so I really worked very hard to make sure, as best I could, that I was not going to come home and say, oh, I wish I had done that a little bit differently. And that's great with subjects like Moai statues where they're not going anywhere and you can sort of take your time with the composition. But with a scene like this, considering what else can I add? Fine, it's an interesting statue. There's some context in the background. But if we can find a spot where we've got more that we can add to the scene, to add an additional element of interest, I think in some cases, in many cases, so much the better. And really, it's a matter of asking yourself, do I need to add more? In some cases, the answer will be yes. In some cases, the answer is no. In some cases, you're not sure, in which case, capture the shot both ways. You can always delete one of the images later. I'd rather have the shot and not need it than vice versa. But again, considering what might need to be added to make this scene a little more compelling, a little bit more interesting. But then the converse of that is important as well, which I alluded to earlier, is what can you subtract from a scene? And this, this was an absolutely magical evening in New York City when I was leading a field photography workshop there. I actually ended up with a shot of a lightning strike in the same scene with the same color, but just absolutely glorious color. And the sky was so amazing that I felt that I absolutely needed a wide shot. That works to some extent, but for me personally, it starts to get less interesting because now the buildings are less identifiable and maybe the bridge is a little bit less identifiable and less standout. And there's sort of then a feeling of, it's a great sky, but did I need all of this other stuff? And there are certainly other ways that I could compose a scene, different positions from which to shoot, different techniques where I could have a larger subject in the foreground, for example, with the sky, but sometimes it's just a matter of subtracting. So after this amazing display of a sky that seems to be on fire, a little bit later as the sun got down in the sky, this next shot is literally from the same evening, oh, maybe 20, maybe 30 minutes later, something like that, and the colors changed dramatically. Well, now the sky was still very nice, but it wasn't as far-reaching. It wasn't such a wide range of color across the full sky. And so it was a good opportunity to tighten up that scene so that we focus a little bit more on the Brooklyn Bridge, for example, and some of the key buildings of Lower Manhattan. And so, you know, I would say that in many cases, if you're starting wide, if you think you need wide, consider that you might also want to tighten up that scene just a little bit. Uh, yeah, Jerry asked a good question. I, I, I'm not sure that I've ever thought about that, but he asked if I would call my style minimalism uh, with things like the hot air balloon and the horse on the field. I do tend to favor relatively simple compositions. So yes, I suppose it would be fair to say that in general, I have a tendency to lean toward minimalism in my photography. I do tend to take an approach of, as I mentioned, less is more. I'm usually doing more subtracting from the scene than adding to the scene. Uh, and actually, okay, Linda's great question here, do you generally crop in camera? More on that in just a second, but to some extent, yes, but I don't wanna crop so much in the camera that I regret the decision later. And so I try to make sure that I'm getting theoretically the perfect composition right from the start but I also realize that there's a chance I'm going to second guess myself a little bit later. And I do generally favor relatively tight framing. And so here, for example, just enough space. What's just enough space? I don't know. But I know when it feels like I've framed a little too tightly. I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. And I know when the framing is a little bit too loose, essentially, where 
it feels like the subject is kind of floating in space, which sometimes is a good thing, but sometimes it's not the right answer. And so more often than not, I tend to frame relatively tightly. Of course, I'm not using a camera that captures, well, it could, but I don't capture square format images. This was cropped in post-processing. This is the original photo. And my emphasis here was realizing that I was going to want to crop. I didn't necessarily know it would be to a square, but I knew that I would want to crop out the left and right sides. And probably, possibly crop from the top, but wanting to have a little bit of space. So again, that sense of balance where the woman's head and shoulders are, let's call it the lower third, the basket on her head is, we'll call it the middle third, and the sky is the top third. Not that those are exactly one third measurements within the frame, but just in terms of sort of like a foreground, middle ground, background sort of concept. Well, I wanted some space. I wanted there to be a nice balance, and so I wanted to include a little bit of sky up above, but I, I'm not sure that I consciously had this thought, oh, I'm going to crop this later, but there was certainly a sense that I didn't need, especially the clutter in the distance on the left side of the frame, but I didn't need as much space as I had horizontally, but I did need the space, or at least I felt that I needed the space vertically. And it, it just so happened, I know, you know, nowadays with Instagram, many people will crop to squares. I don't crop to square very often. Usually for me personally, I'm cropping the way I want to crop aesthetically. And then if it starts to look like a square, where it's really close to a square, my feeling is if it looks like a square, it should be a perfect square. And so in that scenario, then I will lock in the crop to a one-to-one -one ratio. I normally do not crop with a fixed aspect ratio, but as soon as it starts to look square, then I'll usually lock that in. And again, trying to find just the right balance. Uh, tight framing, which again, to Jerry's question, I, a degree of minimalism in that regard, but you also need to be careful. And so to Linda's question, do I crop in the camera? Yes, I do, but sometimes I regret it. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that cropping in a moment here. But you've got to also be careful not to frame too tightly. And as I've mentioned a couple times, there's no strict definition. It's not like, you know, I need 10% uh, of the outside edge of the frame to be empty. Uh, you know, the subject can't come within X percentage of the edge. It's just a visual feeling. And this image, I actually worked pretty hard. This was in Colombia, in Cartagena, and there were flamingos, obviously, and peacocks and macaws and parrots and whatnot. And I spent a considerable amount of time. There's some rather strong lighting and nice shadows. And these flamingos just did not want to keep very still. It felt like they were trying to make it difficult for me. As soon as I would get into the right position, they would move. And so it took a bit of effort, but finally I got this shot and I was so relieved. Uh, Cartagena, Colombia is generally a pretty hot and humid place. I was ready for some air conditioning, so I moved on and I regretted it because this is, in my mind, quite a bit too tight. My framing is too tight, and this is the best shot of the bunch. There's some others that are good, but this one really stands out as the best photo, except it also stands out as being cropped too tightly in the camera, and when you crop in the camera, you're stuck. And so, yes, I do crop in the camera, but I try to remind myself not to keep it too tight. And that's especially true, by the way, with architectural shots where you may want to apply some perspective corrections a little bit later, and you're going to possibly need some additional space for the proper cropping of that subject. So try to be careful. When in doubt, I would say, don't crop too tightly in the camera, save it for later. I know we're supposed to get it perfect in the camera, but I'd rather it be perfect at the end rather than risk making a mistake in the camera. So when in doubt, give yourself just a little bit of extra room. This also leads to the notion of cutting off a subject. And I know many photographers have a tendency to be a little bit uncomfortable. Well, with a photo like this, I would say you probably wouldn't think twice. If, you know, when you first see this photo, I would imagine, I think, that your first reaction is not, oh no, it's cropped way too tightly. You should have shown the entire bird because this is sort of a portrait, essentially, a head and shoulders shot of this bird, and I think it works very nicely. And I think most photographers, I'd like to think most photographers would agree, 
that this is a good overall framing, that it, it's not a problem that we cut off the bird. In fact, it's probably advantageous because now it makes it a more intimate shot. It makes it more about sort of the character of the bird and the colors and the texture with just enough room that it feels comfortable, a little extra space in front of the bird and the direction the bird is looking, essentially. And so I think it works out fine, and I think most photographers would agree there's no problem cutting off a subject like this. But with a scene like this, I find that photographers have a tendency to struggle a little bit more. That they seem to invariably, in my experience, with a shot like this, for example, include the entire tree in the frame. And that can be perfectly fine. In fact, you might go wider and include three trees in the frame. And so there's all sorts of different possible interpretations, but I do tend, as I've mentioned, I tend to simplify things perhaps a little more than uh, the typical photographer. And so to me, it was this intimate shot of a silhouetted palm tree with this beautiful gradation of a sky in Hawaii. And I didn't feel that I needed the whole tree. Now, sometimes I don't include the whole tree because there's another tree right next to it that's overlapping. And as soon as you include the entirety of this tree, now you've got part of the other tree and it's sort of this slippery slope where now, well, I got to zoom out so I can get the second tree. Oh wait, now there's a third tree. And before you know it, you got a whole forest of trees and a less interesting photo. And so sometimes, you know, your hand is forced a little bit. Sometimes your hand is forced and that's a good thing because it gets you into a direction that might be better than what you would have initially have started doing. But again, finding ways that we can make a photo also more interesting. You could argue that this follows the rule of thirds to some extent by having that tree offset. And based on the shape of the tree, in order to do that, we sort of have to cut it off. Well, at least with this type of a framing, a relatively tight framing. But I think it's also important to just keep in mind that it can be totally okay to cut off a subject as long as you're doing it in a thoughtful way, a deliberate way. And I'll talk more about that here shortly. I often, I love photographing doors. I have so many photos of doors. At some point, I need to put together a collection of door photos. I find them very, very interesting, especially when they're weathered and textured and have interesting colors and color contrast. This is in the Trastevere neighborhood in Rome, Italy, uh, off a, a hidden alley, essentially. And when I share photos of doors, I often get the question, why did you not include the entire door? And my typical answer is sort of that everybody knows what the rest of the door looks like. You don't need to see the entirety of the door. And very often, if you cut off part of the subject, you're sort of zeroing in on more of a still life. It goes from being just a documentary photo of what a place looked like to taking in some of the more interesting details, some of the nuance of the scene, the way this plant, uh, I'll call it ivy, I'm not sure exactly what kind of plant that is, but the way that hangs down around the door and the color contrast between the door and the wall and the texture of both the door and the wall, and even to some extent the rain spout over on the left, sort of serving as a framing element, can be kind of interesting as well. And so very often I find that cutting off part of a subject works very well. It makes the image stronger with sort of less clutter, less distractions, and more of just the core character of the scene that you're photographing. That said, it's important to be deliberate with the edges, and especially the edges of the frame overall. Back in the old days of scanning slides, for example, I would tell photographers that you need to make sure to go around the entire edge of your scanned image to make sure you cropped it properly. Because if you got a little bit of the slide mount included in your scan, then you're gonna have this black area along the edge of your frame, and you sure don't want to notice that after you've made a big print and hung it on the wall. And in photography in general, beyond scanning slides, <laughs> dating myself a little here, is being deliberate with the edges in general with your composition. And so really looking around the entire edge of the frame. And so here, of course, what caught my eye, this is at Lake Retba uh, outside of Dakar, Senegal in Africa. And what caught my eye initially, of course, was the colorful boats with 
the lettering and the numbers, the of course the, the weathered look on them, the texture, and then to some extent the reflections in the lake as well, and then the oars of course. And so going around the edge, so on the left hand side for example, making sure that the number 10 there is included in the frame. And above that, I forget now what that actual word was that was written on the boat, the uh, reddish boat in the background at the top left, but making sure I don't have an awkward cutting off of one of the letters, for example, that would look a little bit odd. Uh, down toward the bottom right, the reflection of the number 7, the 07 that is reflected in the water, making sure that's not cut off in an awkward way. Uh, the boat at the right center, not having just a tiny sliver of boat, just enough, hopefully, uh, the oar at the top center having enough space. And it's not that I really think about all of these individual elements necessarily at the time of capturing the photo. It's more that I'm conscious of the overall framing of the scene. And if I have anything that's just barely sticking into the frame or just barely sticking out of the frame, or like that flamingo where it wasn't touching the frame, but it sure needed some more space. But being deliberate, scanning around the entire edge of the frame whenever possible. It helps to have subjects that are not moving too fast, of course. But again, being deliberate with that thought of framing the overall scene. And also, I know I've shared this example a number of times. Some of you have probably seen it more than once. But being mindful of intersections or awkward intersections. And that includes that previous concept of looking at all the edges, making sure you don't have an object that's just barely sticking into the frame or an object that's just barely sticking out of the frame. And so, for example, if the tip of the space needle here, that antenna essentially, if it were just barely sticking out of the frame, that would be, I think, a little bit of a problem. And also in this context, not having an intersection where your subject suddenly doesn't stand out very much anymore. And so here, shifting your position just a little bit over toward the right, so that instead of having the space needle lined up with the building in the background, or overlapping a little bit with the building in the background, you can get the Space Needle a little more into the open space. And so, being careful not only about the edges, but within the frame. And very often you can just shift your position, left or right or up or down, just a, a very small amount in order to get rid of those sorts of intersections or distractions. And then, you know, we talked about how I tend to be a little bit minimalistic in many respects in my photography, zeroing in on a key subject and those sorts of things. And that certainly can work. So this is a waterfall in, in Austria, very close to the Alps, and it's a very lovely waterfall. And so I photographed it as a waterfall, as we often do, but then realizing that as much as the shot is about the waterfall, there's greater context, I think, that can be somewhat important. And so backing up just a little bit, shifting over into a different position and getting a wide angle, a little bit wider angle lens, filling the foreground with the interesting rock texture, having the stream flow out to the bottom right, forming a little bit of a, almost a leading line diagonal there at the bottom right of the frame, but still including, in this case, the entirety of the waterfall as well as some context. So now this is an example of you know, not focusing on being minimalistic in my photography, but trying to give you a sense of what it's really like to be there. In some ways, the only thing missing is the roaring sound of this waterfall and the trickle of the stream. But visually, you know, this is sort of what you're really taking in if you were standing in this position. It can also be helpful, and actually this photo sort of conceptually exemplifies that a little bit, but the notion of having an anchor. So placing some object or subject at one of the corners, possibly very close to the corner of the frame, and that can become an entry point. So here, I think the tendency of the viewer is going to be to first zero in on that hay bale down at the bottom right, and then they sort of meander back into the distance, maybe slowing down as it gets more foggy and difficult to see off in the distance and exploring the frame just a little bit. And then uh, here with a stream, another stream in Austria, placing a boulder. So being thoughtful about the overall framing in terms of uh, 
including what felt like just enough of the stream and what felt like just enough in the way of boulders and being thoughtful about the edges. So up at the top left, that boulder that has a little bit of space up above it, but then also creating an anchor, which is similar in concept to the notion of that top left boulder. The boulder down at the bottom right is intended as sort of a visual anchor. It is quite often going to be something that the viewer zeroes in on first and then hopefully visually meanders through the rest of the photo. And then I would also say that in some cases, you know, when we focus on composition, I feel like there's a tendency to focus on objects in general, to focus on subjects, people or animals, for example, or key elements of a scene. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that color can be a subject unto itself, essentially. Now, granted, this is more than just color, and that's usually, of course, going to be the case, but color is what drew me in. This is in Australia, and this is in a fishing town, and there was a sculpture at a traffic circle that had these fishing poles, these colored fishing poles, and so I wanted to try to interpret what is essentially just the color, and so I went back and forth and around looking for the right subject, and I wanted to also convey that these were indeed fishing poles. This is from a fishing town, and obviously it's a, an art exhibit. I, I don't usually see fishermen with wildly colorful fishing poles, at least in my experience. And so trying to zero in on just the color and really making the color the key subject of the photo, sort of the key motivation for why I wanted to take the picture in the first place. And then finally, I would say that one of the key things when it comes to composition is to practice. And I think even without a camera, certainly if you can get out there with your camera as much as possible, then you can always review those photos, kind of self-critique those photos. But even when you don't have a camera, to be observant, to look around you. You know, when you're taking a taxi ride in New York City on a rainy day, looking out the window and thinking about, oh, I wish I'd had my camera. <laughs> if I had my camera, how would I frame up this scene? And so to always be observant. And when something catches your eye, it's not to say that you every time you're walking down the street, you need to be looking for photographs. But whenever something catches your eye, there's a reason that it caught your eye. Contemplate what is it about this subject that caught your eye, that made you want to look, to examine, and really do examine and consider how you would frame up that image, that scene, in an interesting, hopefully, way. All right, so we do have some questions here. I'll get to as many of these as possible. In the meantime, I do want to say a quick thank you to all of you. Thank you to Tamron once again for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series. I do want to mention during the month of October, which is quite literally right around the corner, I will be leading two live online workshops. So no, not in person, but via online virtual classroom, essentially. One will be on Improve Your Photography, where I'll certainly expand upon these concepts of composition as well as exposure and approaching the scene. And then I'll also have another workshop on creative effects in Photoshop, sort of taking your photos beyond just the photo. You can get more information about a bundle of both of those workshops by following this link, timgray.me slash October 2020. But do note, if you're only interested in one out of the two, at the bottom of that page, you'll find links to the individual workshops if you want to sign up for just one or the other. I see Dave asking if I'm using a tripod for these. I'm guessing that that refers to those long exposures, possibly, in which case the answer is yes. I, As I alluded to at the beginning there, that rare photo of me using a tripod, my personal tendency, I'm not suggesting this is the right photo, uh, the, the right approach, I should say, but for me, I only use a tripod when I need it because I find I just... I find a tripod too constraining. I want to be able to get my camera into just the right position, and so I generally work without a tripod. I know photographers, and I have tremendous respect for photographers who use a tripod for every shot. That's just not my style, but yes, when it's a long exposure, that's when the tripod absolutely comes out. Uh, Bob's asking about the door photo. Now, of course, there were two of those, but same question would apply. Crop in camera or post, and those are actually in camera. Generally speaking, 
I don't need to do much in the way of cropping in post. Obviously, I showed one or two examples where that was necessary, and I'm certainly not averse to cropping in post-processing, but I try to get it just about right in camera. And of course, sometimes I might set my crop after the fact, you know, for different reasons. And so it just, it depends a little bit on the particular scene and subject, but, uh, oh, and I was going to mention also, of course, if I have a crooked horizon, which I would like to think I never have, and yet they seem to crop up every now and then, no pun intended. And so in that sort of uh, scenario, it can be a little bit uh, tricky. All right. Uh, so Phil asks if there's any advice about using a fisheye lens in composition. That's a great question. There are a couple of things I would say. So first and foremost, with a fisheye lens, you have a tremendously wide angle of view. And so I would say one of two things, which uh, would apply to some extent with any wide angle shot, but obviously is a, a special case with fisheye. Number one is trying to have a very strong foreground subject. So if we were trying to show this really diminutive view of you know, the world, of, of nature, of a landscape, I would generally try to find something in the foreground, maybe some flowers I can place in the foreground or some lovely rocks or you know, other textures or water with reflections. Or another, it, I suppose it's a little cliche, but it very often works, and that is to take shots from unique perspectives. Very often when I'm shooting with a fisheye, for example, I find myself lying on my back to take in the full scene around me. So uh, especially, you know, if you've got tall subjects, you know, trees around you or even mountains in all directions or within a city scape with, you know, skyscrapers and other buildings, uh, that can work very, very nicely. Uh, Minnie's asking how you lock in a square in Lightroom. When you go into the crop in Lightroom, over on the right-hand side, you will see a little lock icon. It literally looks like a padlock, and next to it is a set of aspect ratios on a pop-up, so you could choose the one-to-one -one option in order to be able to lock in that specific ratio or any of the other ratios that are available. Uh, Richard's asking if I typically shoot with zoom lenses to aid in-camera cropping. Yes, absolutely. I know forever it feels like photographers have been talking about zoom lenses versus prime lenses. And as a very general rule, there's no question that a prime lens will typically give you greater sharpness, greater resolution compared to a zoom lens. That said, today's zoom lenses by and large are of exceptional quality. And so I find that I do not regret using a zoom lens at all. I don't pick just any zoom lens. I've talked about some of the lenses that I've been using recently in terms of having more flexibility in my photography. And yeah, I do typically make use of zoom lenses really for that flexibility. Yeah, so Karen's asking about being in focus versus out of focus. So with the wide angle of the, the man on the horse focusing on uh, versus out of focus with the grass and then the close-up of the flower. And so some of that is uh, just sort of decided for me in terms of technology, you might say, because if I'm focusing at a considerable distance, especially with a relatively wide angle lens, I'm going to have lots of depth of field whether I like it or not. If I'm focusing very close, like macro would be the extreme example of that, I'm going to have very narrow depth of field whether I like it or not. Beyond that, it becomes really a creative consideration. I do tend to like rel uh, narrow depth of field shots. I find that they tend to just add an interest, a visual interest, that can work very nicely. It doesn't work for everything, of course. And so I think of it in terms of, do I need to be able to see all of the detail here? With the photo of the, the parrot, for example, I'm not sure actually if it's a parrot or a macaw, but I think it was a parrot. In any event, the background's out of focus because if it were in focus, it would be distracting. With the landscape, everything's in focus because it's a landscape where we want to be able to see all of those details. With the flower, the oriental poppy with very narrow depth of field, that was really just a creative decision. I just wanted to have a more sort of, I'll call it artistic if I may, <laughs> a more artistic interpretation of the subject without having to feel like everything needs to be in focus. And 
you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But more importantly, I find that depth of field does tend to be a subjective area in photography. Yes, as a general rule in landscape photography, we want depth of field all the way from the foreground to the background. And yes, in macro photography, it's virtually impossible to get uh, much in the way of depth of field unless you're focus stacking. And some photographers, you know, I'll, for example, in landscape photography, still use narrow depth of field because I just find it interesting. And so I would say there's no one right answer. And you know, photograph the way you like and certainly get the opinion of others, get critiques from others, but don't take it too seriously and take into account the sort of perspectives and the biases of that, the person who's reviewing your photos. Gary's asking, so he's using a Sony camera that has both scene mode and creative mode and asking if I ever shoot using these settings. I don't. Uh, in large part, always shooting raw, most of what you're going to end up with is not affected by many of these other settings in the camera. Okay, well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we did have a fire alarm and there was just another brief one, thankfully very brief. So uh, if the alarm goes off again, we'll cut it short. So I'll thank you again in advance, but in the meantime, I'm gonna to try to get to as many of these questions as possible. So to Gary's question, generally I'm, I'm pretty minimal about using other settings in the camera uh, in terms of those scene modes. They can. The main reason I would say that you might use them, assuming you're shooting raw, is to get a different sort of interpretation for your preview in the camera, which can help in your creative process. And speaking of which, Douglas asked about monochrome versus color when planning composition. With, with monochrome, texture takes on a much more important role, in my opinion. And so you want to look for compositions that are going to maximize the textures that are available there, or at least make the best use of them. It's not that you just need texture for texture's sake. And so that's going to come into play. That's also another scenario where you might want to set your camera, even if you're shooting raw, set your camera to black and white or monochrome mode, the preview on the camera, on the LCD, will be in black and white, but then when you process the raw capture later, it's magically back to color because that was just an in-camera setting that is not actually preserved in the raw capture. And Charles asks a great question when it comes to you know wide versus cropping. Why not take relatively wide shots and do the crop and composition in post-processing? To some extent, I would say that's a good idea in terms of making sure that you've got more flexibility. And I would also say though, that that changes your perspective. Now, I've talked in the past about how it's not the lens focal length that changes the perspective in the scene, it's your position, the camera's position relative to the subject. It's how close or far away from the subject you are. However, if you get closer to the subject, you're going to use a wider angle lens. And if you're shooting with a really wide angle lens, you might get further away from your subject uh, or with a longer lens, I should say. And so that lens choice is going to play a role. It's going to alter your position potentially. If you're shooting a little bit wider, you might adjust your position. So I would just be careful of that as well. And then finally, a Douglas question here, when applying perspective correction, such as in Photoshop, are pixels lost or in other ways distorted? So think of it as sort of stretching or skewing. I think the way you can think about, at least simply, a perspective correction in Photoshop or Lightroom or any other software, take your rectangular photo and imagine that you can stretch it so that the top corners are pulled outward so the top is wider than the bottom. There is some degree of interpolation. Pixels are being added to the photo. Think of it as resizing the photo, where you have to add pixels to the photo when you enlarge an image. Well, you're enlarging the top portion of the image, or you're shrinking the bottom portion of the image. So there is some interpolation happening in that regard. And because you've now stretched or skewed your rectangular photo into a non-rectangular shape, into a trapezoid, for example, now we need to crop, and that's part of the reason we want to shoot a little bit wider in situations where we know we're going to apply perspective correction, is that you're gonna to wanna to have enough space to crop the top, for example, that we stretched wider without losing too much at the bottom of the frame. All right, well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that will be a wrap. We'll hope not to have another fire alarm going off. Uh, false alarms, I should point out. <laughs> At least I'm pretty sure they're false alarms. But in any event, sorry for the, the delay caused by that fire alarm. Thank you for your patience. 
Thank you for spending this time with me. I very much appreciate it, and I'll certainly hope to see you again in another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Thank you all very much.